Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for the Aperio Micro Conference. Um, to, uh, these events uh, sort of grew out of um, uh, the Aperio Board's uh, interest in strategic planning and inviting uh, guests from all sorts of different spaces across open source and higher ed to talk about uh, the, the key considerations and the, the value drivers and so on that are impacting um, not only open source, but um, open source and its uh, use within higher ed, both as an academic and administrative tool. Uh, so we've carried them on and um, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll also be posting these um, to the Aperio YouTube channel. Um, afterwards, you can see the prior ones that we've done and um, obviously this one. Uh, I'd like to quickly share some of the upcoming events that we have. Um, essentially, the second uh tuesday or sorry wednesday of every month uh we're hosting um a micro conference so uh, if you want to just block that time out or that day out we're also trying to uh recognize the global audience um, and schedule these so that uh two parts of the world are inconvenienced and uh one part is is uh it's, it's very doable. So hopefully we'll, you'll find a time uh, that works for you in your location. And uh, so we have some really good topics, folks from Eclipse Foundation, uh, the Chaos Project, the Linux Foundation, um, Open Source Community Africa, um, the OER Foundation, and a couple of other spots. Um, today, uh, we're talking about uh, preparing the next generation uh, of open source developers. And uh, while it pains me to solely focus on, and I don't think at all this is, is what this discussion will be, but as an introduction to focus on um, sort of uh, employment readiness, uh, it is clear that open source and open source skills are now uh, high in demand uh, for graduates in technology fields and even business fields and understanding of open source. Uh, the Linux Foundation's open source jobs reports uh, annually highlights the the number of, of positions that require open source skills um, and the growing demand for open source talent. Um, I also have been doing this for years and I threw it in here uh, just to make the point uh, about open source and higher ed and, and higher ed's dependency on open source. Um, every week I go through and pull the jobs that are currently being advertised in higheredjobs.com and list how many open positions uh, higheredjobs.com has. And uh, just this week, there were 240, 284 jobs seeking open source experience. And that's just where it says open source in the job title. If you look below, you'll see Python. There's 2,118 jobs currently posted looking for experience with Python, 1,000 for Linux, 400 and for PHP and WordPress and Moodle. MySQL, Drupal. I mean, it's just the skills and the experience and the, uh, that are being sought by employers, including those in higher ed, really highlight the, the importance of uh, including open source development and practices and principles even in uh, these uh, in a student's uh, coursework and curriculum. So I was very excited uh, that uh, we have the folks from uh, the RPI's Arcos um, Rensselaer opens, uh, they can expand the, the, uh, that for me, um, uh, with us today. Uh, so we have, uh, Alice Bebo and Wes Turner. Um, Alice is a coordinator, uh, with the, uh, Arcos, uh, program. Uh, Wes, I believe is the faculty sponsor, or I'm sure he has a title he'll share with us. Um, and Wes is also on the, uh, Aperio board of directors. Um, so uh, he's got a great perspective um, from both the campus and um, foundation level on this. Um, I'll also add that uh, I've had the opportunity to get to go over to the Arcos uh, um, program. It's absolutely fantastic. And I thought this would be really beneficial for those faculty and um, others on campuses who are looking for ways to um, involve open source software as both a laboratory or development for teaching computer science, computer engineering, um, but also for providing real world experience 
uh, for their students. The program, I think, is an exemplar and is a reference implementation for other campuses um, around the world that, that want to do something like this. And I know they're open to partnering with folks. I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about it. I'd like to again thank Alice and Wes for being here. And with that, I will turn it over. Uh, thank you all so much. So this is Arcos. Um, and one of the things, this is our second biggest, this was about two years ago, this is our second biggest um, in-use lecture hall on campus. We have two bigger ones. Um, we've now moved out of, as if you can see, we've got some people up in this corner who are standing and we have some people sitting on the stairs. We've been moved out of this room and into the biggest uh, frequently used room on campus now. And uh, largely that's because we've we've been able to grow. Um, what we're going to talk about today is this. I mean, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how Arcos is, is uh, organized, a little bit how we started. You know, hopefully give some pointers on if you want to start something yourself. But the key is, is this group of kids, this group of students, um, and I'm looking for Alice in there. She's probably standing behind me helping to take the picture. Um, these group of students are actually what Arcos is, and that's really where we want to focus. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, about Arcos as an entity, and then uh, Alice is going to talk to you a little bit about the student experience and what the students see from Arcos's standpoint. Um, standard copyright. Um, Arcos was created a few years ago. I'll talk about that, but our mission statement hasn't been changed much. We've tweaked words here and there. Mission statement is to cultivate an inclusive, creative, and entrepreneurial community that seeks to empower students to develop open source solutions to real world, world problems. And uh, you can find that in our handbook. You'll find links to that all over the place. But I want to, I'm not hopefully going to read off the slides mostly, but I did want to focus on a few things here. Um, Arcos is intended to be inclusive. We want to bring in people of all types. Uh, we also want to um, bring in people from multiple disciplines. Uh, so we are thrilled last summer when I had uh, architecture students join Arcos and we use their artistic talents in the development of some games. Um, we want our students to be creative. Um, Patrick talked about the job market. We want not only people to go out into jobs, but we want them to create jobs. So we want them to be entrepreneurial. Um, and we want them to work in open source to find solutions to real world problems. And let's go to that real world problems. Um, if you're a student, a lot of your real, real world problems are things you find on campus that are just um, deplorable, like our student information system, which is a web-based interface based on 1970s terminal uh, output. So our students get together and they work on problems like that. We have two different com uh, competitors, both of which are better than the built-in student information system the registrar provides, uh, Quacks, questionably accurate, course scheduler, and Yaks, yet another course scheduler. The students created those, they conceived those, they've been running those for, I think it's eight or nine years for Yaks and, uh, and uh, three or four years for quacks. Um, but then we also look outside and we have projects like Soundscape. Uh, Microsoft developed some technology to help visually impaired people navigate outdoor environments. Um, they are dropping it. They're allowing it to go open source. Arcos is involved with the consortium uh, to actually make that open source transition happen uh, and continue allowing um, visually impaired to compete in things like uh, orienteering competitions, or even just walk along park trails. So real world problems is is broadly based. Um, we're also, by the way, as a, as a kind of a bow to Patrick, we're an affiliate member of OSI. He worked very hard uh, to, to get us into that organization. And we've continued that, uh, even though he's uh, now here with Aperio. Um, it's nice to continue working with him. Um, we were created back in 2006 by Sean O'Sullivan. He was an alumni of RPI and he wanted to do something that would uh, reach out and help the students. And you probably can't read this little stuff. There's really no read, no reason to read the little stuff, uh, except that's actually the quote from the founding document. Basically, it's our mission statement. Um, but the other part of this is it pays homage to RPI has is, is always been an educational innovator. Uh, we've innovated in pedagogy and 
under our new president. I think that's going to continue and maybe even accelerate. He wanted to find ways to reach out to students and prepare them for, again, technologically based careers. Um, the job things does come up, particularly when you're talking about college and people paying a lot of money that they have to make up. Um, you know, our students want jobs. They want to be technologically uh, on the edge and they want to know that they're out there competent and prepared. Um, this was how we originally organized. There's not really a, a lot to go into here other than, you know, what I mentioned about our founding document. But originally we sat, we sat underneath the Office of Ed Undergraduate Education. There was a director. Um, we were set up to have internal and external advisory groups. And then down below here were how projects got started. I'm gonna tell you that the internal and external advisory groups have largely fallen by the wayside. And because of the ways things have kind of maneuvered with staffing, we probably fall more under the Department of Computer Science or the School of Science than the Office of Undergraduate Education now. But other than that, this is still pretty accurate. And here's kind of where the important parts lie. Um, we have our Orcos organization, we have a website, and then we do student, then we do projects. And our projects can be created by the students themselves. They often are. Quacks and Yaks are two examples of that. They can come from external partners, relief agencies, NGOs, development organizations. I'll throw in uh, open source project products from, from industry. We work with IBM quite a bit. I mentioned the Soundscape. That's an external partner, an external consortium that is actually being formed right now. It's not actually in existence. Uh, and then we occasionally have external students come in. Uh, we had a, a student, uh, Leon Montialegre, who came in and brought a project with him uh, called Open Circuits. Open Circuits is a digital si circuit simulator. It's now being used in our classrooms after four years of development here by Leon. He got it into our, our uh, uh, circuits course, um, and it's actively used and still actively developed. We had some leadership, uh, Frank Luck was our initial director. Uh, it was then shared, he was uh, under the computer science department. It was then shared by Badri Roysam and Makai Krushnamorthy. Uh, Makai was, is CS and uh, Badri is CSE. So that was when we were kind of under the Office of Education. Uh, Badri left, uh, leaving Professor Morthy um, and kind of completing the transition to a CS organization. Um, I took over after Professor Krishnamurthy when uh, he, after many long years of service, decided to retire. So uh, that's kind of just our leadership progression. We haven't had a lot of leadership, a lot of leaders. Um, I think they've done a, a really good job before me, and I'm hoping that I can continue that going forward. Um, when I look at our coast now, right, we have a lot of students. We're a big organization. Uh, we get a lot of cooperation on campus. It's kind of hard to think about how you would create an organization like this. So I want to go back and kind of talk about how we got started, because if you want to grow something like this, it really doesn't help to come in with and say, oh, we're going to have 300 students uh, a semester through this program. Um, you have to start with something that you can actually uh, grasp and, and kind of nurture and, and, uh, and grow. So at the start, Arcos was, was solely a student organization. We had a good grant from Sean O'Sullivan. Uh, students were paid to work on open source projects, largely. Uh, they created our website, our initial website. We're now on version four of it, I believe. Um, we developed an open source course. That course is still taught. It's been revised every semester that I've taught it. I believe Professor Morthy, who taught it before me, did the same because open source moves on. Things change. Um, things that were popular drop off and things that didn't even exist are now being used. So that was developed, uh, that Sean's money paid for part of that, um, but no grant is forever and even $2 million only lasts so long. So after a while, we started running out of the ability to pay students, particularly as the number of students invested in, in our coast got bigger and bigger. And as that happened, this was kind of the brainstorm that, that kind of allowed us to continue growing. We began to transition to a four credit academic organization. Um, so Arcos is now offered every semester uh, and students can join it at any time and, uh, and, and uh, participate as a club or as a learning experience, 
or they can actually take it for, um, generally it's for uh, uh, elective credits. Um, we still have the ability to pay students when we need to. Um, this initial transition was, was enabled by something called undergraduate research proposals or undergraduate research at RPI. Every student, we were about, you know, think about 30 or 50 students at this point, every student would submit a proposal, fill out a URP form, they would register for Arcos as a zero credit option. Uh, and then all of these URPs would go to the registrar and they would have to process them and they would wonder why uh, David Goldschmidt, the assistant director of, of Arcos, was filling out URPs and willing to manage 30 to 50 students. Um, and he was willing to do that because we had a support organization in place and it wasn't really him doing all the work. As we continued to grow, right, that became a lot of paperwork. Um, so eventually, just by sheer persistence, uh, the registrar, who, who, by the way, are very nice people, uh, gave in. They gave up the formal paperwork part. And now students still have to fill out a proposal, but it doesn't go to them for approval. They don't have to fill out uh, a separate form to get credit. They can just get credit by registering for Arcos as an actual course, uh, which makes everything, including my job, significantly easier. That doesn't really tell us what Arcos is. Um, this student group thing and this class thing is kind of a dichotomy. Um, you know, classes are run by professors uh, who have, you know, the ability to make all the decisions and rule with an iron fist and student organizations are run by students and students are generally at rpi only four years before they move out and then we get a whole new crop of students in so student organizations tend to be flexible and a little less formal um, and well a little bit more inclusive um, so we try to be both we still have our community of motivated students a lot of our students a lot of our uh, uh, um, Leadership in particular um, are taking it for zero credit. Um, we do still try to get them to take it for three credits or for four credits just to keep them uh, getting some benefit out of it. I always feel guilty making students who are taking it for no credit work very hard, um, but they do that anyway. Um, but then on top of that, we also have the ability to do open learning and student teaching, explore the world of open source, oh, and get course credit for it. Uh, while you're doing it. Um, so Arcos has been called the one course that you're allowed to fail. Um, and that is this open learning and student teaching part. Um, we don't judge you by the success of your project. Um, I think we all know in the real world that deadlines slip, uh, things change, these grandiose proposals that you have at the start of a project uh, end up being, well, grandiose and not uh, achievable. So we allow the students to to learn those lessons and we allow them to learn it in a safe space where we're looking at their efforts and their contributions through the semester instead of just what um, they actually, you know, what their project actually does. We want that we want their achievements, not their project's achievements. And this allows them to reach out and do bigger projects than maybe they could otherwise. Um, this is a little bit encroaching on Alice's domain, but in Why Take Arcos, unique open-ended learning experience. You can explore the technologies you want to explore. Um, there's no, you don't have to have a final goal. In fact, we encourage our projects to continue from semester to semester. Um, here's the, the job thing, val valuable resume boosting side projects. You're all familiar with the ability of people to go into things like GitHub or GitLabs and actually find out what people have actually done. So your online contributions become in effect your resume. We have a, a community of skilled developers and when we are able to bring in external developers such as uh, uh, IBM or um, the Soundscape Consortium, we are able to bring in additional skilled developers beyond those on campus and beyond those in Arcos. Um, but quite honestly, with 20 mentors and seven coordinators, we have a pretty big community and, and, and a couple of faculty, I guess I should throw those in. Uh, we have a fairly big community of skilled developers as it stands anyway. Um, Arcos is still a student led organization. Um, I run a lot of the classwork kinds of things. I, you know, 
am responsible for doing the grading and everything. Um, but we do have leadership opportunities, including mentoring and, uh, and TAing uh, and helping with the grading. Um, and, and then at the end, you can also receive credit for your work. So, you know, we try to grow a community. We try to grow leaders. We try to be a place where people can explore new technologies that they may not actually understand yet. Um, I think the one anecdote that I like to tell about that one is my first exposure to Docker was uh, a student in Arcos giving a, a workshop on this interesting new project that he had discovered called Docker. And by the way, he was going to use it in all of his uh, ongoing projects to set up development and environments that were superior to what he could get with, uh, with VMs. Um, about two years later, it's all over the place and campus is heavily using it. I'm using it in all my courses. Um, all right. This is kind of our growth. I think if you look down at this end, this is when we were strictly a student organization. And you can see we came up and we plateaued at probably around 50. By the way, the blue are students, um, red are projects. This is the per semester enrollment. So Arcos can be taken multiple times. The 4,420 students total um, is, is double counting students who may have taken it more than once. So that number is you know, lower in terms of unique students. Um, semester by semester, this is the same chart cumulative. Um, you know, so we have spring, summer, and fall. You have to kind of read it that way because um, spring and fall are much bigger than summer in general. Uh, and in general, our spring semester, when we can start bringing in incoming freshmen, freshmen generally don't take this their first semester, but they are allowed to take it afterward. So spring tends to be a little bit bigger in general than fall. So we had our first plateau at about 50 students. Uh, and then we started transitioning to being able to take it for uh, course credit. And we kind of peaked up here to between 100 and 150 until about, oh, 2019. And then things started going a little wild. Um, enrollments are way up and we're starting to bring in students from other disciplines as well. And if you ignore the two years of COVID when everything dropped a little bit, uh, you can see now we're in the 200 to uh, 250, 275 range. Um, projects have kind of paralleled that. Paralleled that. Um, this semester, we're working on 65 different projects. If you figure 300 students, 65 projects, that's about five students per project, which is actually a pretty good size, although our, our distribution is from one till about uh, 16 or something like that. Um, so that's just kind of how we've grown up. One of the things we'd like to talk about is, um, so that that's kind of how we've grown over the years. It's kind of important to talk about what we actually do during a semester. And this is what a semester looks like from my viewpoint. I think Alice has a little bit of a different uh, spin on this, or at least a little bit different details on it. We need to get 300 students now working on a project. So we take the first two weeks of the semester, five classes, something like that, to allow anybody who wants to pitch a project to pitch. Uh, this includes external people working in industry, you know, external uh, non-industry people. Uh, we have a project from WPI. Um, we have done websites for uh, charitable organizations, uh, volunteer, uh, uh, sign up sheets, you know, kind of kind of uh, functionality, um, or, you know, students themselves can pitch projects, uh, either existing projects, projects that are continuing from semester to semester, or projects that they just want to try out uh, on a semester basis. And we take two to four classes, depending on, on the amount of pitches we have for students just to give us, you know, the elevator pitch, what do you want to do? After that, we, we kind of have, uh, it, it's been variously called project pairing or speed dating or, or different names for it. But we take a day where we just have all the students and all the projects get together and talk. Uh, and students can join projects at that time. Once a project is joined, the students write a proposal. And this goes back to kind of the URP thing. We want to know what they're working on because we need to know how, to, we want to give them feedback. You know, are what you, is what you're doing, planning to do practical? Um, do we think you can achieve it? How could you make it clearer? Do you have clear goals for this semester so you don't spend the first half of the semester uh, 
you know, lost and not creatively or productively lost, just plain old lost, not, not knowing how to get started. And, and that's, this initial proposal allows us to do that. That's kind of the same thing it did uh, when the registrar required it for the undergraduate research proposal. Um, but we do it now so that we can kind of get a handle for what projects we have uh, and, and make sure that everybody has something concrete to work on. We then, once the proposals are, are generated, we work into something I like to call normal time. Um, normal time, we'll have an occasional speaker come in. Uh, Patrick has, has talked to us before on, uh, on licensing. Um, we work on our projects. Generally, we divide the students up into 10 different rooms, about 30 students per room, about two mentors per room, and then we distribute the coordinators, however, you know, to, to, to fill in wherever we have weaknesses. And then I walk around to all the different rooms and make sure that, that things are going well. Um, during this time also, Every mentor and all students, every mentor is required to uh, give a workshop and all students are encouraged to give a workshop. And these are talks on technical fields. Uh, we will require somebody to do one on Git. We will require somebody to do one on licensing. Uh, we will, I think Alice actually did that one this year. We will require somebody to do it on project management. But uh, after that, there's, you know, wide open. Do you want to talk to us about Docker? Please go ahead. Do you want to talk to us about uh, React, you know, wonderful topic. Um, so, you know, this is kind of our, our working phase, our working, learning, exploring phase. People go through, they make contributions. These contributions are going to be what they ended up being graded on. Um, they're graded on the effort they've made, uh, you know, how much they've contributed, how hard they've worked, and not necessarily on uh, the fact that the problem they chose was really tough and they didn't make as much progress as they thought they would make. Um, after normal time, we have the wrap up period. This is currently where we are right now. During the wrap up period, um, students continue working on projects, but we pull out um, about a fifth of the students, fifth of the projects per class period, and we have them give final presentations. Uh, the final presentations are um, what did you do? Who's on, well, what's your project? Who's on your team? What were you trying to do in broad terms? What did you actually do in narrower semester focused terms? Um, and how does your how did you organize your organization, your, your project um, to be an open source project? You know, what technologies did you use? Do you have a README? Do you have contribution guidelines? If you're a single project, maybe you don't single person project, maybe you don't need a contribution guideline, but tell me about that. Tell me the considerations that went into your organization and uh, and 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 how you're actually organized. So, you know, that's the presentation. And 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 after that is the end of the semester and uh, and within a few weeks, the start of, of the next semester back here at the initial project definition. I did a quick strengths and weaknesses analysis. Uh, we've got a new president at RPI. And part of what we were asked to do was present to him uh, some of our, our different programs. This was one of them that I presented. Um, we have a lot of strengths. Uh, we are we have managed to do our inclusivity at least as well as you can at RPI. Uh, RPI is a very uh, uniform kind of uh, you know we we have a very biased distribution of of, of students, um, but we are. We do uh, recruit more uh, DEI students than uh, computer science as a whole, um, and we are working very hard to make it even more inclusive and more accessible. Um, one of the things we find is that students who aren't finding a topic in the major that they want to explore will oftentimes come to Arcos and use Arcos as the learning environment. Um, web is not web development is not a part of the core CS curriculum. Uh, it's ITWS, not CS. So a lot of students come to us and work with ITWS students to actually get that practical experience. Um, you know, we pull in students from uh, many disciplines. Um, I think this is, you know, pretty, pretty good. I've talked about most of this. Um, you know, we do have some issues. We are trying to, we, we are limited on mentors. Um, mentors are self-nominated. And unless we have a big pool, you know, we, we don't have the ability to, to be all that as selective as we would like. However, we find that by the time a student has been with us two or three semesters, they're ready to be a mentor. They're generally well uh, prepared. 
Um, the problem is, is by the time they've been with us two or three semesters, they're also approaching their senior year uh, and they're ready to no longer be with us at all. Um, we do have funds, but we, are, we don't have a lot of funds. So we are kind of uh, uh, limited in some of the things we can do. Uh, and we do have very large class sizes, which kind of limits how much I can get involved with each individual uh, in each individual project. Um, so just a quick recap. We are a unique synthesis of a student group with an academic organization. We don't believe we've seen this anyplace else. We have students as a, as a critical part of the leadership infrastructure. Um, we fully use as many students as we can in our leadership and in our, our running of the course. Students have the ability to start courses. They can explore any technologies they want within practice so long as they make it open source. Um, and uh, we augment that as much as we can with external and internal mentors. Um, the programs we see tend to have lower numbers, um, have one or a few projects, uh, are instructor driven where the instructor picks the project or limits the projects. And uh, they tend to run for a semester or two and then not run for a while and then run for a semester or two. We've run continuously uh, for, I think, the entire time that I've been at RPI, which would be uh, since 2017. Uh, I can't speak for before that. It looks like we took some summers off, um, but we generally are running year round. We do have some aspirations. You know, we do want to become more central to campus and we do want to reach out to other organizations. So uh, as organizations approach us or as we, we meet up with them, we are working very hard to, to try to build, um, build more of these uh, bridges and also build bridges and build a presence at RPI. And I think most of that is what's talked about here. Um, one final thing for me, I think, is uh, our course itself is run as an open source organization. Faculty coordinators and mentors form a community. We drive to consensus within, you know, within reason. Uh, I do have, but rarely use veto power. Um, all of our materials are online. Our website is online. Um, our, is, is created online and is available. Um, our handbook is online, which describes all of these processes, everything we do during the semester. Uh, and we have uh, all of our communication takes place in the open on Discord. So if you're thinking about starting a project, you know, we have a lot of documentation, a lot of stuff that can help you. And, and, and we remain uh, uh, more than willing to, to jump in and, and help as well. So with that, I'm going to introduce Alice, or I guess Patrick already introduced Alice. She's been my coordinator for a long time. Um, she's one of seven this year, and she's going to talk to you, I think, about the student experience. Um, Alice, are you? Uh... Yep, I'm here. Um, and yes, I will be talking about the student experience. Um, you touched on some things that I'm, I'm really glad you did because, I mean, I obviously offer a different perspective as I am a student. Um, but so, I am a coordinator. I've taken ARCOS for six semesters now. Um, coordinatorship is like the highest ranking student leader in ARCOS. Um, and that's just a product of the time that I've spent there. Um, but I, I'll talk about the leadership structure a little bit later. I was a student mentor earlier. Um, and before then, I was a student. And when I was a student, I didn't always succeed. Uh, Professor Turner did talk about how this is the one course you're allowed to fail. Um, and that is one of my favorite, favorite part of Arcos. Um, so if we could scoot on to the next slide, I can extrapolate on those things. Um, the leadership structure in Arcos is interesting because we are all undergraduate students. Um, we have had some graduate students. Um, we have a program on at RPI where if you're an undergraduate student and you decide to stick around for your master's, you can do your master's degree in one year and all of your scholarships carry over. So that's been a popular thing. We've had coordinators stay for five or six years with that program. But for the most part, uh, we disappear pretty quickly. Can we get the next slide? So uh, this is what our leadership will look like next semester. Um, it's still a good pile of folks, but it's very obviously different. Um, we have people who came in after COVID. I've been here before COVID. Um, the gentleman in the bottom right corner, his name is Lucian. Um, he 
was at RPI in 2016, um, and he took our coast way back then. He left to go do some other things with his life, and he returned to finish his degree. So he's been around since way before COVID, since before I graduated high school. So we have a huge variety of different perspectives, um, a huge array of different goals we all want to achieve within Arcos. We have ideas of where we would like this this course to go, this club to go, this community to go. Um, but we have a small amount of time to do it. And I think that is also why it's cool. No one can really have a stranglehold on Arcos. It's always what the people want, which is also the beauty of open source. Um, if we could advance the slides one more. Um, so Professor Turner showed us this timeline earlier. Um, we have the initial project definition, execution phase, wrap up period. Um, and obviously we're in the wrap up period now. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about what class actually looks like because it's not extremely clear from this timeline, even though Professor Turner did explain it pretty well. I want to talk about kind of what it looks like in practice, if we could scoot one over. So normal time class, um, one of my fellow coordinators took this picture in the room that I am in every Tuesday and Friday from 4 to 6 p.m. yesterday. So that bottom right picture is, that's where we do Arcos on the day to day what it has looked like for this past semester. Um, we do a, um, I try to keep it between five to 10 to 15 minutes, but some people like to add more context or less um, depending on the people. So a coordinator or a mentor will stand in front of the class and give people the lay of the land. Uh, we'll tell people about new, exciting open source opportunities available to them. Um, we have had a lot of hackathons and uh, outside companies being like, hey, we'll give you money if you figure out a good way to, um, uh, we'll give you money if you figure out a good way to monetize your open source product, um, if it's something that we think is worth investing in. So we have, sometimes we have a robust agenda. This is, um, this is pretty normal. Uh, the agenda items that I have highlighted today, because um, these were all yesterday's lecture. So Beginning of class, we stand in front and we tell people what they need to do to succeed in Arcos. And then the bulk of the class, after that is done, we're just coding. Um, mentors and coordinators ideally would walk around, uh, check on all the student projects that are going on. Um, that's one of my favorite parts because I get to see how all of these open source projects are doing, what people are learning. Um, Sometimes there are people who've done some crazy, crazy things. Sometimes there are people who don't know Git yet. Um, so sit down, resolve some blockers with them. We call them blockers. They're anything that students run into uh, in the way of problems while they're trying to work on their open source projects. Um, and as you can see at the bottom of that agenda, we've got workshops. Um, Professor Turner talked about those a little bit. That's when a student uh, or a mentor or a coordinator were required to do one each semester. Students are required to do two now because um, we were seeing some low attendance in previous years. Um, that's where we get to talk about the cool open source things we've done. Um, I did give a licensing workshop and I did use Patrick's materials. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure if I did them justice, but um, it's always informative and people always use the information they learn in the workshops, even if they don't listen. <laughs> during the workshops. Um, they use them eventually in the class, which is always cool. Um, attendance, it, it's a class. A lot of these people are taking it as a four credit computer science uh, 2000 level class, which means that it counts as it's an elective for most people, especially for me. I'm a senior, so I don't need 2000 level classes anymore, but um, we have to take it a little bit seriously. Sometimes people would rather stay until 6.30. They want to code the whole day. Um, sometimes people want to leave at 4.30, so they don't have to do much. Um, but in order for the class to be taken seriously, and I think we've done a good job of this this semester, we do take some attendance, we do make sure people show up, and we do make sure people contribute. Um, next slide. Um, so the folks standing in front of the room in the picture that we saw last slide, um, 
those are the student leaders, quote unquote. Um, but we have a bunch of different kinds of leadership in Arcos. And it's been very interesting for me, especially since I've been here for three years. Um, and it's, it's changed as we've grown. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this. The professors, obviously, they are the, the heart and soul of Arco, specifically Professor Turner. He has, he's the, the main gear that keeps us chugging. Um, he's also been here the longest, so you, you know what's been going on, how we can succeed. You have the best advice because we're students. We get up and we leave and new coordinators, coordinators are often only coordinators for one or two semesters before they graduate because it requires um, a certain amount of time that you've been in Arcos before you get up and leave. So Professor Turner is the thread that holds it all together <laughs> from my perspective, um, which is great. We also have Professor Kuzman, he's very helpful. But so um, a tier below then, um, and I used tiers, it used to be very flat um, in my experience, when, at least from a student's perspective, all the way down at the bottom, you look up and you see mentors, project leads, and coordinators in one level, and then you look up and see the professors. But it's kind of shifted as we've scaled because we need so many different kinds of boots on the ground to communicate so much information to so many students. Um, I know I have slightly different numbers everywhere than Professor Turner did, but um, we have some more people who joined a little bit late to Arcos, so that's where the 330 comes in. Um, Oh, excuse me. So, coordinators. We meet with Professor Turner uh, two times a week to make the lecture slides, to make the announcements, to make sure everyone's on track, to talk about people who might need extra help from us and try to mobilize something to go and help them out. Um, and we have different priorities. Um, the professors are obviously teaching us what we need to do, and we end up kind of the people managers. We're talking to the mentors and making sure that the mentors communicate the information to their students um, and that the mentors know what's going on in their small group rooms, um, which, as Professor Turner mentioned, is the division of all the students into actually workable classes where you can sit down and code. It's not the gigantic lecture halls, even though we do use those for presentations and in the beginning of the semester when we're pitching. Um, but the what I'm tr really trying to show with this diagram is that um, the mentors and the project leads, even though they're not making the slides and they're not telling everybody what to do all the time, which is, I feel a little bit bossy sometimes as a coordinator, um, those people are really the ones who are teaching, quote unquote. Um, the mentors are teaching the students how to succeed in Arcos. They're teaching them how to use Git. They're teaching them what about the licenses that they want to use on their project. Um, gonna try and make sure they don't get into any legal trouble if they want to use a tool that isn't licensed properly. Um, and the project leads, they know the things about their project that they need to teach to their students. Maybe there's a technology that no one is taught in computer science that they need to teach their students within their project. Um, maybe there's a skill, maybe there's a weird organization of their project and maybe their project has existed for a long time. Um, it, it goes many different ways. So um, it's a lot of, it's become nebulous and a strange, large problem to tackle, especially for students. Um, I never thought I would end up being more or less responsible for this many students. And I feel a certain responsibility to make sure that they succeed within Arcos. Um, but it ends up being, we all benefit from the shared responsibility because we all want each other to succeed. Um, and because we're students and they're students, um, you can communicate differently um, to get results that you would like. So um, I can tell the students in my group that, hey, you're allowed to break things, 
if you need to do that to learn your technologies in order to succeed. And they believe that coming from me. They don't necessarily always believe that coming from a professor because the RPI computer science department, the programs are, it's wonderful, but it can be very, very rigorous. And Arcos, I think, though it has its own types of rigor, it kind of counters the academic sharpness of some of the other courses at RPI. Um, if we could go next in slides. Um, yeah, so the student perspective, what does that look like? All the way down at the bottom of that uh, diagram that I just made, um, we have a whole pile of projects. Um, these are what are pitched in the beginning of the year. You join one and then you stick with it. You code for the project, you work on the project for the rest of the semester. Um, we have external projects. IBM has a lot of projects that they um, like to pitch to us. Um, and we've, we've had some really impressive student um, participation in those projects, but we also have some really, really long standing internal projects. So Submitty is a project led by Professor Barb Cutler. Um, she is amazing. Um, and Submitty is actually the thing that all of the computer science courses use to grade code. Because um, that's obviously a nebulous problem that is hard to do. Like you could take screenshots of um, submitted code and have that be what students are graded on, but that's never as thorough as professors would like it to be. So Submitty is a robust tool for that. Um, the, the, the duck and the script down at the bottom are what those are. Um, how to website right in the middle there. Um, that is my project this semester. Um, and that one's a little bit more nebulous um, because I designed it that way I want it to be. Um, computer science majors are not taught web science. Professor Turner was talking about it a little earlier. Um, and that's, um, to go back all the way to Patrick, that is one of the things that people really, really look for when they go to school for computer science. They really want to get a really fun, shiny job that might allow them to go to California and make piles and piles of money. Um, but in order to do that, you need a certain set of skills. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, and Arcos kind of lets you do that. Um, as you can see, there's this whole pile of projects that I've been a part of, and there are lots of different skills on there. Um, I don't necessarily always put Submitty on my resume because I did not do terribly well in that class. I did broke things, well, break things. It was the middle of COVID, but Arcos is, you're allowed to take it many, many times. So I have taken it several more times and I've done several projects, many projects. This semester I'm working on like three separate repositories. Um, I've I counted at one point I was working on five different websites at the same time and RPI doesn't teach me how to make websites. That's just not, um, I'm only computer science. I'm not web science. Um, that's not part of their curricula. Um, but I have these skills because Arcos gave them to me because I chose my projects according to what technologies I wanted to have under my belt. So, um, and I could go over each of these uh, we talked about Submitty. Um, because it's led by another professor, it's a little bit more rigorous in some of those ways, which is why I didn't do terribly well. Um, but I worked on an IBM project, um, and I got to do some cool open source porting um, and work on their mainframes, which is wild. Um, and that was an experience I would have never had uh, if not for Arcos. Um, Graph is a tool that some students use to help with graph theory. Um, it's now archived. It's not really being worked on anymore. But I was forced to learn JavaScript in like two weeks for that. So that was really nice. <laughs> really, really important. Um, I would have not learned JavaScript. And almost every job that I've applied to, they want me to do uh, code interviews in things like JavaScript and TypeScript um, and Python. RPI does teach Python, but it doesn't teach um, these scripting languages that are so ubiquitous in the job sphere these days. Um, a series of small projects was a dig. Uh, I 
I was the only person on that project. It was a single person project. Um, I just wanted to learn things. Um, so this semester is kind of an offshoot of that. I expanded my project to include multiple people and how to website ultimately is I wanted to make a full stack website with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, just a really simple portfolio website that I could send to employers and be like, hi, I'm a computer science major and I know how to code. This is something I have made. Um, Cause RPI doesn't otherwise give you the opportunity to do that. Um, you're not supposed to open source your homeworks. You're not supposed to, um, you're not supposed to show people your code. Um, and it's not pretty. It ends up being terminal applications that spit out text, which is great. Um, it's great to learn concepts that are going to be very applicable in the workforce, but it's nothing that you can really show an employer and be like, this is cool. I did this. So, um, I have four other students working on this with me and I've basically just been kind of guiding them along, teaching them HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, and they've made some really cool websites just almost on their own time that they can now show to potential employers and be like, hi, I made this. Um, RPI didn't teach me how to do it. I did. And this random girl who wanted me to know these things, but I did this. So you have this thing that you can show to people and be like, I have real applicable skills in the real world. And it's, it's nice to show that. Um, telescope, I'll only go over that very quickly. Um, Arcos has had a series of websites um, because we are an open source um, community. Of course, we need an open source hub that uses cool open source technologies. Um, so somebody decided to make it in Rust. Um, so I learned Rust to try and help out with the Arcos infrastructure. Um, we ended up making a totally new website the semester afterwards because no one else wanted to learn Rust. But in the pursuit of better leadership, I did attempt to learn, and I was able to make a few commits. But I think that speaks mostly to the ever-changing nature of this class. Uh, Professor Turner, uh, could you? Oh, yeah. So um, this is kind of the big picture why 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 all of this why have i been taking it for six semesters professor turner did talk about this but from my perspective it's just a little bit different um because we we do all have ideas we all want to do the personal projects that jobs require us to do um when you're applying to jobs that's the main thing they ask they're like what have you done outside of school that shows that you care about this position that you care about coding that you want to be a programmer you don't always have the time for that when you're taking really rigorous engineering school classes that don't allow you to open source your code. Um, and Arcos gives you that opportunity and that is so, 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 so valuable, which is I think the main reason why it's grown so much. Um, you also obviously get a computer science grade boost because of that, but it's not the only reason why people take the class. Um, the industry applicable technologies and skills and the personal projects that you use those technologies to create. That's everything. That is why we do it. That's why we continue to do it. And that's why Arcos is going to stick around for a long time and probably continue to grow and expand to other schools. Um, for me, it's all I talk about in interviews. Uh, my resume is mostly Arcos, even though I've had three or four internships at this point. Um, you get a lot of soft skills. You're able to talk to people. You're able to present. You're able to manage people, which is useful in every sphere of life, even if you're not actually um, a project manager or like a leader of a club. Useful everywhere. Um, front end technologies, a little more technical there. RPI, the computer science department, you just never, you never encounter that. And they, Jobs always want front-end developers. They always want people who can't just code in Python. They want you to make something pretty. That's not something that's taught and we need it to be taught. And right now our coast provides that opportunity to computer science majors. It's so, 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 so important. I've said it so many times and I can't reiterate it enough. Um, passion, motivation, I think I've exhibited that this whole way through. Um, 
But open source, very final, final bullet point. Um, that is the spirit of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I think that is what drives student leadership so well, is we're trying to create things for other people to benefit them because that is just the right thing to do. We need these skills. Uh, we want to succeed and we want our peers to succeed. Um, so the spirit of open source, even when we're not actively developing using open source technologies, that is what drives us forward. Um, I think that's it from me. Well, thank you, uh, both Alice and Wes. Um, so we do have some questions and um, we might run a little over, but um, I'd like to ask the questions and, and get your comments uh, just for the recording, uh, even if folks have to take off. Yeah, um, we can so, put up our contact information just in case if anybody wants to get in touch with us, please feel free. Ah, thank you. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, uh, Jen Cummings, Michelle Hall, and uh, Kathy Acevedo for helping coordinate everything today. <laughs> uh, for folks who don't know, my power literally went out um, 15 minutes before we started. So uh, thank you for them for stepping in. Um, just so going over the questions, um, uh, I'll start with the ones in the chat. Um, so we had a question about uh, learning more about how students feel about Arcos projects and the impact they think they have on their post-university careers. I think Alice, you talked a little bit about that, um, but is there anything you want to add? Maybe some trends that you've seen um, from uh, the students uh, after graduation and, and have they gone into open source um, careers or careers where open source has played a, a, a role? Um, yeah, I mean, everything that's really used commonly in industry, um, all of the scripting languages, React, um, all of everything you use on the day-to-day -day basis is open source. So even if you're not actively working on an open source project, you're using important open source technologies. Um, so that is true across the board. I actually am going to be working with a company that works on open source code when I graduate. So it's applicable to everyone um, and a pretty common story for the people who have been able to find jobs after graduating. All right, great. Um, Wes, uh, did, I, if you want to add anything there, great. But also, uh, there was a question about if I had no founding money and wanted to pitch something like Arcos to a university, uh, what message or argument or what would be the pitch that you think most effective? So I think I've been thinking about that because uh, the founding money was good and it, it actually forced RPI to, to take us seriously. Um, but I don't know that it's necessary uh we've been doing you know since we got established we've been doing pretty good uh without it um one of the things you can you know in place of founding money um well the, the first pitch that that's going to make sense you know from our standpoint is our, you need to have students working together in projects doing collaborations and learning about open source because it's big um so just even allowing them to form a club and you know if you get a if you get a handful i think we started out with five students um originally you know just a handful of students who are who are motivated uh, who are willing to work on it is is a good way to go um we also for a number of years were working on projects that were benefiting the department or benefiting the school of science so we were actually able to to, to pitch for some money to give the students um you know a, a reason a motivation uh to do that as well um but you know getting away from money at, at, at all you know if you can do it as a if you have a, a research program um and and a, and motivated students and and a couple of uh faculty who are willing to, to step in and, and be the mentors for that i mean i think that's actually uh you know you, you'll see that when, when you look at when we went from uh purely paid to course credits our numbers went up substantially uh, and quite honestly most of the students who have the opportunity to take it for pay were taking it for course credits because um it was actually more valuable to them as a course than it was as you know than the money we were able to pay them so you know i think i think the, the pitch you want to make is this is the right thing for the students start small um, you know, start with with a, with a nice core group that's motivated, and and just kind of take it from there. And I think 
and and come to us for help. You know, we can we can we can help you avoid some of the pitfalls and, and things like that. And and Alice, just to follow up on that, what what would be the pitch you'd make to students? Maybe if it's going to be a club, an initiative that's started by the students, how would you how would you start this up with a pitch? Um, if it's just going to be a club, I mean, if you have motivated people who want to work on projects, or maybe even have like everyone has an app idea. Um, everyone who goes into computer science at least is bothered by people who are like, hi, you should make this app. Um, the club would provide infrastructure and developers for something like that. So it'd be popular with more than just computer science majors, probably with people in different schools, business spheres, because um, that's what we end up. Um, that's the type of thing that uh, an entrepreneurial developmental club like this attracts. So um, anything to incentivize students to work together on projects like that. Um, that my pitch for Arcos, um, I tell people that they can work on personal projects for credit for school. Um, so that is a really, really large piece. It's a huge sell. Um, so having infrastructure like that at your school, if you do have the research program, extremely helpful. But if you don't have that, starting a club, there will still be interest. All right, great. Uh, a couple, I guess, logistical questions. Are, are the projects um, designed or designated by the faculty or students? Or um, how are the projects identified and come to be? So uh, anyone is... Uh, yeah, so anyone is, is, is you know, including faculty, uh, including students in the club, including sometimes students outside the club pitch a project that they uh, end up being project leads for and not doing ARCOS at all, um, not getting a grade. Uh, so anybody's allowed to pitch a project. We, we, we leave it fairly open. I do interview external people to make sure that the project seems within our you know, we, we have some rules, right? Um, we don't mind working for projects that benefit businesses as long as they're truly open source. Uh, we don't have them working on proprietary code, um, you know, things like that. Uh, you know, there's probably certain fields that we wouldn't, we've never had somebody come to us with something, you know, that was completely immoral. <laughs> um, so, you know, but you know, we would weed those out as well. But basically anybody can come to us. They're not designated by faculty. It's it's a uh it's it's peer peer to peer or or project to uh project to student um mutual interest. Projects have the ability to turn down students either because the student isn't prepared or because the project size is just too big. Um and students don't aren't forced to be on any any specific project, although they are forced to be on a project. Um we do have that requirement. Is that, did you have anything? Yeah. Um, Alice, do you want to add anything? Yeah, um, so they asked, um, at least part of the question was who pitches the projects. Um, most of the projects are actually led and pitched by students. Um, it's students coming up with ideas and it's students who end up leading many of them. That we have several professors and several external projects who are leading projects. Well, it sounds like that creates the opportunity for students to do more than just the technical development. They've got to do sort of some analysis of the of the space that they want to develop the project for, things that exist already, what resources they'll need to develop it, what types of folks they'll need to get involved. So wow, it really sounds more than just sitting down and coding. Not that the coding is not important, but um, it's a it's a it's a holistic approach to, to development. That's uh, great to hear. Um, and what about the folks that are um, in your roles as mentor, Alice, as a mentor or coordinator, are, um, do you get some extra, I don't know, free parking or something at least, uh, um, something on your, on your, um, your grade influence in some ways? Um, what do you get for stepping up into those um, more responsible roles? Well, um, it's, it's, it's told explicitly to mentors in part as a way to sell the position and in part because it's very true. Um, leading requires resources of the students. It requires time and energy, um, obviously. So when we're grading mentors on their code contributions, um, we're more lenient because we know that they're contributing a lot to the class. Um, uh, 
I'd be impressed if I was able to fail at this point in Arcos, because um, I do kind of treat it as a part-time job at this point. Um, but for me, it's all glory. Um, I get to spread the good word of open source. Um, and I, I do get four credits of computer science uh, course. Um, and at the, this point, I have had I've been in it for six semesters and I've been taking it for credit each time. So I have 24 credits of Arcos on my transcript. Um, and I tend to do really well because I really like using my time this way. So I do, I have a nice little GPA boost from Arcos. That's a great incentive. It's, I guess, the free parking you were alluding to. But um, even if I didn't have that, I would still do it because I just enjoy it. Great. And um, I think the last one here is, uh, this was sort of something I was specifically interested in. How has the program uh, in and of itself as a sort of academic endeavor and the interest from the students um, had an influence on other programs, departments um, uh, on campus? Have, have, have courses started using more open source that maybe didn't before in CS or engineering programs have like I think Alice, you mentioned business or, um, you know, those that are taking business courses begin to include open source, you know, considerations in business. I mean, have you seen the interest in growth in Ar or, and Arcos impacting the campus courses and curriculum? Or, and then also even maybe the IT department, do you see that um, administrative and, and, and central IT have been influenced or have, have adapted their uh, what they do because of all that's happening in Arcos. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I was waiting for Alice to, to comment on this, but but uh, maybe this is uh, more in my battle. Um, so, you know, speaking first for, uh, you know, the central IT for, for the department, um, we've recently changed uh, presidents and, and, uh, and he's really intrigued with Arcos, as far as I can tell. Um, so we are actually seeing a big move. Uh, we've been in discussions with uh, .CIO is our IT organization, Department of the uh, Chief Information Officer. And just recently, we've been having a lot of conversations. I mean, they've adapted to us, but a lot of our projects you'll notice are, are you know, if you go to our website, you'll notice that a lot of our projects are web-based. Um, we have a lot of client server organizations. So getting servers for students to experiment on has always been a problem. Um, if they do a good project, they run out of a, a, free AWS credits fairly early. Um, so they've actually begun adapting to that. And, and uh, Jay McLaughlin from, from our department um, is, is setting up a pool of VMs and he and I are trying to figure out how best to use them. Uh, so we are getting some movement in, in that way where they're, where they're you know, kind of adapting to us. Uh, I don't know that they use any more open source software, but they've always been a Linux based shop. So, you know, they, they are they are pretty, you know, in, embedded in, in at least at that level. Um, other departments are really interesting because we are actually seeing it. Um, we have Bram Van Hooven uh, from uh, uh, Haas. He's a CogSci guy, I believe. Um, Good. Uh, he's been running a number of projects through us. Um, he was he had his own pet projects before, and he's been working with us. They weren't licensed at all before. Uh, now we have them all licensed. Uh, they're all openly available. You know, so we've got a big big buy in from them. Uh, I was talking to CSC just uh, the start of this semester. They are getting very involved with a uh, robotic operating system ROS, and they're trying to bring it in as a collaboration between you know, Arcos and the CSE department, um, you know, we've seen it, we've seen, you know, some, like, like they have, uh, you know, some other initiatives, we've worked with some Haas people before. So we're starting to see some, some more uh, impact. Increasing that, you know, is, is one of the, is one of my aspirational goals. If you go back, you know, if I went back a few slides, uh, that's one of the things that I would like to see, because I, we're seeing the groundswell, you know, we've been doing it for long enough that everybody knows about us now and we're starting to see more and more groups come to that. Um, so yeah, we are seeing some of it. Um, we'd like to see more of it. Um, I, I will say that at least two of our projects are being used in classes, I think. Um, so 
you know, we're also being used to, to, to promote just other educational things. Um, yeah, actually, before we wrap that question up, um, as a student, I've seen, I've seen three or four of my classes use the technologies, obviously. So the computer science department, almost every single class that I've taken within there uses Submitty daily, um, like as a way to grade code. But um, we've also, uh, Poll Buddy is one of the projects that was mentioned in the earlier slides. We've used that as attendance in some of my classes. At, at my suggestion, I will admit, but the professors were like, we need a tool to take maybe a fun little poll and also get attendance at the same time. And we've built that. Um, and there's also a class called Software Design and Documentation. Um, that is a 4,000 level computer science concentration class. Um, and they love, they love Arcos because the people who really know how to do things well in that class um, all come from Arcos. Um, they basically teach the agile software um, framework for developing and we tend to fall naturally into an agile structure in the way that we do things. Um, and it, Arcos is simply just, it's well known. Our footprint is large. Um, and we also have so many developers that any professors who want to have a little project, Brahm is an example, um, Professor Barb Cutler is an example, um, but we have had other professors be like, hmm, I have an idea for a thing. Let me go to Arcos and find developers to make the thing for me. Um, so it's been popular in that way as well, because we are a huge and important, uh, not always tapped resource. Well, on that note, um, I think uh, we'll end it there. Um, I'd like to thank both Alice and Wes again for stepping in at the last moment. And uh, this is great. Um, uh, I really hope that this will help other campuses um, find out how they too can create a program like this. I, I think it's fantastic. and. Um, hopefully you'll get some follow-up. We're going to um, post, as I said this before, online. Um, we'll share the the uh, link so that uh, folks can watch it again. And um, as I said before, I think we've really seen the uptake of, of the people watching this after in video, um, especially globally, is, is really where we're getting a lot of interest. So that's exciting to see. I'm sure this will, will also uh, garner a lot of interest.